thank you all very much for coming and for the opportunity to speak. So I'll tell you something about robust sublinear expanders. This is somehow the focus of the talk. This is a, this relatively recent twist on the usual expander graphs, which has found quite some applications. It's quite powerful. And uh, in particular, I want to have some, since there is a lot of stuff surrounding robust sublinear expanders, I want to have a goal in mind. So a specific problem that kind of that we were looking at, and in some sense, that led to development of various things that I'm going to mention. So I'll start the talk with telling you about this classical decomposition conjecture from Primo graph theory. And uh, then I'm going to start talking about these robust sublinear expanders, tell you various nice properties they have. And somehow I want to start with this general problem just so we have a certain application in mind so that certain very strong lemmas that I'm going to tell you are not strange. Why do you want this so super strong version of this connectivity property? And the answer is because we want to use it for this thing. And this is where all of these lemmas kind of got developed. OK, so that's the plan. So I'll start telling you some history and what this problem is. And then I'll tell you various cool stuff about robust sublinear expanders. Good. So uh, erdos galay conjecture is a decomposition problem. It's very classical. But the decomposition problem in general just asks, given some kind of large structure, can you decompose it into as few as possible smaller substructs, substructures, which maybe have some nice properties, are useful, natural, so that ideally you can understand the substructures and maybe lift this understanding back to the original. That's a kind of guiding line behind, behind the composition problems and why they are so useful in a variety of settings. So erdos gala is a graph decomposition conjecture, so we'll be decomposing big graphs. There are also hypergraphs. This is a counterpart generalization, and these two kind of cover actually quite a lot of these more general decomposition problems that have been looked at. And there is, again, a long line of work studying decomposition problems. So what I mean by a graph decomposition problem is that you have a graph, it has some kind of set of edges, and what we're trying to do is partition the set of edges into various graphs. So I'm talking about edge decompositions, not vertex decompositions. That's something I want to point out, and I hope it will be clear, but uh, because it will not make sense in the vertex world. But anyway, vertex decompositions are also very interesting. Last time I talked more about something in that direction, so uh, this time I focus on the more classical thing where you decompose edges. So erdos gala is uh, actually a cycle decomposition problem. So we're decomposing into cycles. So cycles are a very natural, fundamental, very well-studied family of graphs. They are minimal two-connected graphs. They have some nice properties. But really, why I think cycle decomposition problems were also very interesting and why people looked at them for uh, quite a bit and for quite some time now is that uh, there is natural difficulty threshold for decomposition problems. In the sense that if you want to decompose into paths or trees, this tends to be a bit easier, or at least in some sense, cycle decomposition problems introduce one extra difficulty. You don't have these natural traversals that you would have for a tree or a path, so the natural greedy embedding of these structures will not really work. When you try to greedily embed a cycle, you need to connect the back to the beginning. And this is something that pops up whenever you try to do a general graph decomposition or embedding problem in much stronger form. So somehow cycles are really the basic introduction of this difficulty to decomposition problems, which is what makes them already kind of very interesting and uh, in some sense hard very often. So let me start with some very classical ones. So this one is over 130 years old. So it's a theorem of Waletsky from 1883, which says that k to n plus one, so a of with odd number of vertices, can be decomposed into at most n cycles. So if you do a little bit of maths, this clique has n times 2n plus 1 edges. Any cycle cannot have more than 2n plus 1 edges. It can only visit every vertex once. Cycles are not allowed to self-intersect. That's what differentiates them from closed logs. So this is the best you can hope for. You actually decompose this into n longest cycles, so the fewest number of cycles that you could ever hope for. And these are also called Hamiltonian cycles because they need to pass for everything. So this is a super strong result, and in some sense, super strong result. 
And it has been generalized and motivated quite a lot of work after that. So now a second direction, also very classical, also over 100 years old. It's a work due to Veblen, who was actually the director of the institute some time ago. And my position is currently named after him. So I'm happy to advertise a little bit. Uh, but uh, it's perhaps the most natural question which you can ask when thinking about cycle decomposition problems, which is which graphs can you decompose into cycles? So here I put an odd clique and didn't really mention anything about the even ones. And in general, you cannot decompose any graph into cycles because as soon as you have an odd degree vertex, you're just plain out of luck because every cycle will pass through every vertex. Uh, we'll use at least it, either two edges of every vertex or zero. So an even number. So if you have an odd, you're just out of luck. And uh, the nice observation theorem of Weblen, which is over 100 years old, that this is the only obstruction. As soon as you have every vertex having an even degree, you can decompose it into cycles. So graph as cycle decomposition is equivalent to all degrees being even. Okay, so one direction I just told you, the other direction is also not too hard. It follows from an even 150 years older result of Euler on existence of Euler tours. Because if you have all degrees even, you split it into connected parts. Now your things are Eulerian. You find an Euler tour. This is just a walk through your graph, which visits every edge exactly once and goes back to the beginning. So this is not a cycle, right? This is a closed walk. It intersects itself. But you can easily just, whenever you intersect, you just take that out. That's a cycle. Whenever you intersect, you take it out. So anyway, one line will tell you kind of why this is true. And Weblen, actually, it was an observation in one of his papers. He was working on the four-color theorem. And this kind of problem precisely popped up for him. So he observed it. It was Koenig who adopted it as Weblen's theorem in 1935 in one of the first textbooks on graph theory. So these two very old cycle decomposition results are really very classical. This has also been generalized in some ways. And they kind of give you some feeling of what's going on here. But there is a natural question of whether you can kind of combine what's going on here. So this one tells you that if you look at a clique, at a very simple graph, then you can do it with very, very few cycles. This one, on the other hand, tells you when you can do it or which graphs. So a natural question, which Erdos and Galai asked about 60 years ago is, well, can you always decompose into few cycles whenever you actually can decompose? And uh, that's open. I'll say what I mean by few in a moment. But um, just to point out that this argument that I told you about Euler tour, it might decompose it into triangles. It might decompose it in very short cycles. You might need quadratically many. And here you could do it with just linearly many. So that's the subject of the Galley conjecture. So it says that any n vertex graph you can decompose into linearly many cycles and edges. So this bit with the edges is just a reformulation. It's actually equivalent to saying that any even degree graph you can just decompose into linearly many cycles. I'm sticking with the original formulation of Erdos and Galley, which allows you a few edges, linearly many edges in your decomposition just because it applies for any graph, so it's actually easier to work with. It doesn't reply to a specific type of graph that you need to maintain for the arguments and so on. Good, so this is about 60 years old. It has attracted a lot of attention. Erdos himself repeated. It's not equivalent, right? It's only one direction. It is actually both direction equivalent. So you can, like, at least in the sense that uh, up to a constant factor. So this is sometimes called linear, linear Hirsch conjecture. So I'm not sure which one, which direction is. Um, so the thing is, if you can decompose an arbitrary graph into something like that, you do it, you're left with, um, uh, like you will be left with linearly many edges. So, um, so actually, which direction do you want? So one that is not obvious. Yes, but they're both are not too far from, but yes, so for one, you can always just go, and so if you have an arbitrary graph, go and kick out cycles as long as you can. Some point you are left with a forest, which is linear number of edges. Yes. And now this union of cycles is actually has all even degrees. So just use the other version on the, I think this is the non-obvious one. 
Well, anyway, so it, it's a simple reduction from both directions. You get different constants potentially, but and actually Hayosh conjectured around the same time precisely what you like this even degree version of Erdos Galai, and he even conjectured it with the precise constant. So this is called Hayosh, and the equivalent version is linear Hayosh. Anyway, so it's another interesting conjecture. You are perfectly right. Very good. So we have this, it's a very classical thing. Erdos repeated it in four different papers. We found over 10 different papers which highlight it as a very natural problem because in quite a few related problems, getting this kind of linear results is actually fairly easy. So just decomposing into linear number is not so hard and you really want to nail down the constant. And uh, somehow it's very annoying that this is not the case here. And despite all this attention, we still don't know how to do even a linear kind of weakening compared to all of these related problems. And for example, one of them is decomposing to paths instead of cycles. Here, the central conjecture is called Galay conjecture, and it's really aiming for a correct number in front of there. And Lovas has a result from 60s, which uh, gives you a linear weakening. I'm actually going to use a version of it in a moment. Well, a bit later in the talk, but I'm gonna mention. Very good. So that's Erdos Galay. There has been a lot of work on related problems, also covering versions of the conjecture have been looked at in which you don't just you don't insist that your cycles don't overlap. So that's quite a bit easier. It was solved by Piber in 1985, and then Fan Chang raised a couple of conjectures uh, decomposing into paths. So Galai covering version of this Galai conjecture and also of the Hayosh conjecture. These were all solved in early 2000 by Fan. So still very interesting, still not obvious, but uh, much better understood than really decomposition problems. So decomposition problems tend to be a bit harder than covering. I just wanted to mention that these things exist. So going back to the actual conjecture, let me tell you what we know. So there are two big classes of graphs for which we know it's true. The first one is true. So uh, uh, so the, the, the conjecture is about the number of, uh, n is the number of vertices. There's no conjecture depending on the number of edges. Um, yeah, plus, uh, so, in reality, so I'll tell you something about the bounds. Uh, so they depend on average. So the bounds that we have depend on average degree. So in some sense, if you are not uh, so very good point, as far as I'm aware, there is no um, explicit conjecture involving what happens with the densities. And somehow the idea is that it really shouldn't matter. So somehow you can always get the linear thing. And uh, yeah, if you have very sparse graph, then maybe you should be able to do it a bit better. But I don't think that's actually true. I need to think, but because I think you can split it into disjoint pieces or something like that. And that way kind of mess with what you actually, uh, so very good question. I don't actually know, I'm guessing whatever I just said. Uh, but there are the bounds that we'll be getting will depend actually on uh, the average degree rather than, so n times average something depending on average degree. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, all the questions. So going back to what we know about it, we know that it's true for graphs with linear minimum degree or G with minimum degree at least epsilon n. So this is originally due to Kohnman, Fox and Sudakov and then Glock, Kuhn and Osthus managed to even nail down if you have linear minimum degree in your graph, so very dense case in some sense managed to even nail down the correct constant that you get in Erdos Galli. So that's one class of graphs for which we know it. The other is pseudo-random graphs. So for random graphs, this is due to Common Fox and Sudakov again. And then correct asymptotics was determined by Korandi, Krivelovich and Sudakov a couple of years later. And then uh, Girao, Grané, Kuhn and Osthus managed to uh, get a really precise answer in random graph case as well, and also extend it to pseudo-random graphs and not just random ones. So these are two classes of graphs for which we know Erdos Galla is true, and I like to think of them as a kind of case with a tiny bit of structure and a case with a lot of randomness. So what that means is it places this conjecture also in very good company of problems in which we know what to do with it if you have enough randomness or if you have enough structure, but the open thing is really when you don't have 
either enough randomness or structure to use the ideas that we have to actually work with. Like we understand somewhat what to do with structured stuff. We understand somewhat what to do with random graphs. But if you have these kind of problems in which you're in the middle, there is quite a few of them which are struggling with that. So, so what do you mean by pseudo random exactly? Let me not go exactly into, but uh, it should like, you can, they have a property which random graphs satisfy, which uh, is enough. So you don't really need a, so I mean, it's also actually the previous papers also had, were working on something along these lines. So they all are talking a bit in some sense by pseudo random graphs. So yeah, it's, um, I don't want to go too much into that direction. This is just an example of a special class of graphs. If you want to ignore the pseudo completely, it's just random. We know it if the graph is random enough. Okay, so these are two classes of graphs we know. And again, another reason why I find this conjecture very interesting. So that kind of fits precisely in this regime when you don't have enough randomness or structure. And um, okay, so what about bounds? So what do we know about upper bounds for general graphs? So stuff that works for really any graph that you want. So there is a folklore one that says that big O of n log n cycles and edges is enough. And this appears in this first paper that mentions the conjecture. And what it's, how it works is you take the longest cycle in your graph, you kick it out, you take another one, you kick it out. And then you're left in the end with a tree, which has, well, forest, sorry which has at most n edges. So you part, make that part of your decomposition. If you spend five minutes with the pen and paper, you'll see that because you always can find the graph of a cycle of length, at least roughly average degree, that it, this will not take more than log n, uh, n log n removal of cycles. So it's a short computation, but precisely the type of computation that I don't want to be doing today. Uh, I want to give you ideas behind the proofs rather than actually overwhelm you with a lot of various technical details that actually go into various things. So this is not too bad, but still, I don't want to set a bad precedent. Okay, uh, so that's a folklore, very old, somehow very simple idea. And it's remarkable that it took almost 50 years, despite all this attention being repeated, working on various related things to get an improvement over that. And this was again done in this breakthrough paper by Colin Fox and Sudakov. So what they managed to do is improve the log n to log log n. And uh, this is very nice. And precisely because we're fighting for this log n, we want to remove this thing. So this is a pretty strong result in this sense. And really one of the main key ideas that they brought to the table here was that using expanders is useful for this problem. There is a priori and so far completely unclear why in the world would this problem have anything to do with expanders. So I hope to explain that part throughout the talk, but uh, so far they already observed it here and I'll point out later what's kind of changing in what we are doing. So the main result that we proved, and this was a guiding line for various results about robust sublinear expanders that we do, is that you can actually get n log star n. So this log star n is the iterated logarithm. So it's the number of times you need to take a logarithm before a number becomes smaller than one. It's a canonical example of an incredibly slowly growing function. So in some sense, we get pretty close to the conjecture. In some sense, probably at least some of you know that getting rid of log star n functions is, tends to be pretty annoying. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, I think, a very nice result. And precisely it led to, uh, or at least I like it, but uh, it led to development of quite a few tools that I'm going to mention today. So that's one thing. I do want to point out that this might make it seem that uh, Colin Fox and Sudako figured out some kind of argument to go from log to log log, and that we figured out how to iterate it to get to the log star. This is not actually true. I have a very, very different argument. This is already a result of iteration. They have an iterative argument, but this is what you get by using their argument. And ours is a different argument, which again, you iterate and it gives you uh, this one more it's light enough. So this gets me to the second theorem, which is actually an intermediate result, but I like it in its own right. And this is what I'll actually be focusing on for the talk today, because a very short iteration of this gives you that. And if I will have time at the end, I'll tell you. 
But so far, let me tell you what it says. It says that you can decompose always into just linearly many cycles and n times polylog at many edges. So it's an asymmetric version of Erdos Galai, in which I'm not willing to pay more than linearly many cycles, but in return, I need to pay a bit more edges. So it's n polylog instead of log star. And somehow, by some magic, what you do is you take out these cycles, and then you have a much sparser graph that you're left with, and then you repeat the argument for this much sparser leftover graph. That will give you a poly log log, the same version, but with poly log log here, and then free logs, and so on. And each time you pay linear, so in total, it will come to log star. It's roughly where the log star comes from. But uh, yeah, so it's common Fox and Sudakov had a similar intermediate result, except for n times poly log, they had here n to the 2 minus epsilon, where epsilon being 1 over 10, something like that. So polynomial number of edges, much, much bigger number of edges. And also, and then they iterate that to get the log log. And kind of very annoying thing here was that if you want to actually improve something on Erdos Galai, you need a, such a very, very strong improvement in the number of edges here. Because if you got n to the 1 plus epsilon for arbitrary small epsilon, that would still give you just a better constant in front of n log log. So you really need to push it down to n times something that's very small, much smaller than polynomial. So that's kind of the point, and this is the result that I would like you to keep in mind for the rest of the talk. Well, I, it will stay here, so you can look at it, because at various points I'll be telling you, yeah, I don't care about the polylog factors, because whichever polylog factor I get here, the iteration is going to deal with it in the next step. So we have something like 200 there. It's not, uh, not pretty, but not too horrible. And if we really wanted to, we could cut it down much more. But somehow, because of the iteration, just kind of moving it away, the next log will just take this constant in front. The next one will make it additive. So it just like it gets completely eaten up in future steps. So it doesn't matter for us. Very good. So that's the Erdos Galai part of the talk. So now I want to tell you something about this robust sublinear expanders and what it has to do with all of this business. Any questions about this before? This was just some introduction to bring you to a problem which I want you to keep in mind for various things that I'll be telling you about. So let me just mention one final decomposition result, which is due to LOVAS and which we are going to use. So I want to put it here while it's in the company of stuff that's related to it. So it's a theorem of Lovas from 1968. And this is where you get this linear bound on path decompositions. So he showed that any n vertex graph can be decomposed into up to n over 2 paths and cycles. OK, so if you are willing to use paths instead of cycles, then we know the answer. It's not immediate. It's a three page paper. I mean, it's a longer paper, but three page argument for this part of the paper. And it's a very, very clever induction argument which is a basis for pretty much all of the results later on that were developed to push all of these related problems in some sense. And it will be a base in some sense for our result as well and for the common folks in Sudakov one. So it's quite a useful and uh, extremely strong. This is tight. This is the correct constant that you can hope for. So the best you could in some sense hope for. So we actually need a variation of it, the corollary, which you get fairly quickly which says that you can actually decompose an n-vertex graph into n paths so that no vertex is an endpoint of more than two of them. So you have well-spread endpoints. So, so far, I don't want to write that because it's not clear why we want this well-spread endpoints, and it will become clear from various things that I hope to tell you about expanders. But I wanted to mention that there is this path result because we actually use it as part of our argument. Good. So now turning back to expanders. I don't think I need to sell expanders to this group. So they are very widely used class of graphs. Avi has an amazing survey with Hure and Lineal. If you're interested, it's very, very nice, over 100 pages, various applications and properties. 
Uh, and uh, I want to talk about the specific direction that people went, which also found quite a few applications over the past 25 years or so, which is looking at this kind of sublinear expanders. So let me start, though, with the definition of classical expansion. So there are multiple defini competing definitions, depending on what you're doing. This one, I think, is among the ones that are most used and sometimes referred to as vertex expansion. So anyway, a graph G with a vertex set V and F set E is said to be a lambda expander if for every subset of vertices, which is not empty and is not too big, I'll say what this is, but really don't worry about it. It's not too important. What you have for this set is that its neighborhood, its external neighborhood is bigger by a factor of lambda than itself. I'll draw a picture, which maybe says better what I mean. And external neighborhood just means I don't count vertices inside of you. So here's the promised picture. Here's a graph that I want to say is an expander. What I want is that if you look at any subset of vertices, and you make one step out of it, however you can, then the set of vertices that you get is bigger by a factor of lambda than the size of the set itself. Okay, so these are just standard expanders. We're talking about the number of vertices here, so it's a vertex expansion. Very good. And also what this condition is ensuring is that you cannot apply the expansion property to the whole graph because you just don't have space where to expand it. Right. So it would just immediately fail if you don't have some type of upper bound there, but you can apply it up to anything that's maybe that's reasonable, let's say, and uh, it almost never really matters in the arguments. So don't worry too much about it. Very good. So usual expanders and this, like a lot of properties and stuff that people looked at have this lambda being at least a constant and preferably even polylog for some properties that you might want from them. So this is what's been studied quite a lot. And the focus of today's talk will be on sublinear expanders. So expanders in which you have lambda tending to zero with the number of vertices. So lambda expander is sublinear if lambda tends to zero, so it's much smaller than a constant. And actually, for this talk, just think of it as being one over log squared n. So the main idea behind introduction and using these things, which was done by Komosh and Semerity some 25 years ago, is the following natural approach of using expanders. You start with some kind of big graph, and you try to find inside of it a big or expander, big in a certain sense. Roughly the same average degree is what they were doing. If you can do that, then whatever you would like to find in an arbitrary graph, you can try to find in an expander. Expanders have a lot of super nice properties. They make it easy for you to find certain type of things. Then you should think of them as some kind of random-like objects. They have certain randomness properties. So in some sense, they put you in this paradigm of what we know how to do with randomness. So, this is a general paradigm which actually works quite well and has been used in a number of problems. The problem is that if you just really don't know anything about your starting graph, you cannot just find these very good expanders inside. Of it. You'll not be able to find the constant factor expander in an arbitrary graph while keeping, say, the same average degree. And this is where these sublinear expanders come from because you can. So this is precisely, more or less roughly, what you can find in an arbitrary graph while preserving the same average degree. And uh, this was the observation of Komlosh and Semerity. And despite being much weaker than the usual expanders that people look at, they still have enough cool pro good properties that you can prove stuff with them. And there is a long list of results and conjectures that were settled using this kind of idea over the past 15 years or so since 25 years ago or so, Komlosh and Semerit introduced that. And uh, in particular, uh, also what I'll be telling you about today is following this kind of idea. So, yeah. First of all, the condition on the size of the set just becomes n over two then for this small lambda. 
Uh, yes, so two thirds. I want it to be a tiny bit bigger than lambda plus. Oh yeah, two thirds. Okay. And yeah. then uh, I mean, you uh, don't care about the degree also of the graph. So in this case, so what they actually can do, you do, and you're perfectly correct. So what they can do, and what generally you can do when finding in any graph, is actually some kind of gradual decrease in expansion. So small sets will expand better in the sense that single vertex sets will actually expand by say polylog if you have, I mean, depending on what your the original degree is. So at least your original degree, not for me, it's polylog, but original average degree over some constant. And then it slowly gradually decreases until for very big sets, you only can ensure something like that. And this just comes from how you construct it. And if you want some super tight results, you need to use this gradual picture of what's happening with expansion. And it is used. Uh, the thing is that for us, because I don't care about polylogs, I can be wasteful and I can just say something like that. So I can think of the degree as polylog, let's say. Um, so this will not really be the definition we'll work with for most of the talk. So, so far, just think of it really as it's, it's an arbitrary graph which has this property. Maybe like what can happen is, for example, if you take a log squared and many vertices, they might have their only guaranteed one neighbor by this, and it might be connected by a single edge. So, so in some sense, this shows you why these things are much weaker than usual expanders, because you can easily disconnect it. You just remove one edge. There's no robustness properties in some sense that you get from usual uh, strong expanders. But this is precisely the issue that we want to deal with in some sense. So this is the point of the robust part in the beginning of the, so I'll get to that. So far, this is just a normal expander, which has a very, very weak expansion factor. I mean, we're weak issue. Okay, so I don't want to tell you how they actually find it because I'll tell you in a moment how you can actually decompose a graph into such things, not just find a single one inside of a graph, which is what we need for our decomposition results. But um, there, I want to mention that there is a very slick way of finding them, which was introduced by Tomon earlier this year. He optimizes certain average weighted average degree function, and this magically spits you out precisely the optimal expanders that you can get. It actually spits you out optimal robust sublinear expanders, but I'll get to that. So there is just very nice ways of doing that. But since we don't need to find a single thing, we actually need to decompose. I will get to that in a bit of time. So far, I want to tell you a little bit about, um, tell you a lemma and prove a lemma about these things, just to give you a little bit of a flavor what kind of stuff goes wrong and how people actually manage to get around these kind of things and actually prove interesting stuff using these weak things. And we actually use this lemma as well. It's a lemma, as far as I'm aware, it's due to Krivelovich from a couple of years ago, but it's a natural enough thing that probably it, uh, it might have existed before. So what it says is that um, any n vertex, one, n over one over log squared n, has a cycle of length n omega n over log to the four n. Okay, so almost Hamiltonian, almost at the longest length you would want, you need to pay some polyl. And you really do need to pay some polylog precisely because of the type of picture that I drew for you, right? This log squared n sets, we just send one thing up. You'll not include that in your cycle. Okay, so let's see why this is true. And another reason why I want to show it is because the argument is using a so-called DFS lemma, which was introduced by Ben Eliezer, Krivelovich, and Sudakov. And it's a very neat, slick kind of extremal way of using DFS algorithms. So I want to show it essentially. And uh, this will give us a path and then somehow we'll do some expansion magic to convert the path into a cycle. So as I said, the, so let's say proof. So the first line is we're going to use DFS and I'm going to explain if you're not familiar with DFS, I'm going to say what the algorithm does. It's just where the motivation for it goes. So the state at any point in time will be a free set. So to be processed vertices, being processed vertices, and already processed vertices. 
together with the top of the stack vertex, which we are currently looking at. So this is the stack. I will become like so far, it's just a setting up a bit of notation, but I'll draw a picture and explain what the algorithm is doing in a moment. So let me just say also what the initial state is, and then I give you the picture. So initial state is to be processed vertices are everything minus some whichever vertex you choose. You fix one vertex that will be the initial thing we process. So you put that in B. And processed vertices are an empty set, and this V is what's on what's on the top of our stack, what we're really looking at so far. Okay, so let me draw a picture of what this is actually doing. So here you have a set T of two B processed vertices, so waiting in line. Then you have vertices which are we already processed. At the beginning, this is essentially everything, this is nothing. And we have a set B, which are the things which we are currently processing, so which are currently under consideration. And initially, we have this vertex B, and we generally mark it as T, so this is like the top. This will always be a stack of vertices. You think of it, you put one vertex, then you put another on it, and so on and so on. So it makes a stack. If you know about implementations of DFS and in C++, there exists a structure called stack, which precisely does that. So this is just the vertex that we most recently added into B. It's the thing that we will be processing in individual step of the artwork. So what it does is, we look at the two B processed vertices, and if we can find a neighbor of it there, we move it to the top of the stack. So if we find a neighbor, it goes on top of our stack, it goes on top of the previous vertex. So since it's a neighbor, it's connected, you will have an edge, okay? And then you do it again. So this is now our top of the stack. This was the most recently added vertex. We look inside of two B processed vertices, if there is a neighbor, we move it, we put it on top of the stack. And really kind of the main feature of all of this so far is that you'll always be getting a path, right? Because everything that's added to the top of the stack is connected to the previous one. So if you follow down, you will always have a path here. That's a kind of nice observation that's not usually part of DFS that we use here. That's well, they use uh, in various things. Good, so now this would be top of the stack. So at some point, you'll hit the top of the stack vertex, which has no neighbors here, right? And what you do then is it's called popping. So you pop it from the stack and you move it into processed vertices. It's done, it's processed. So if it has no neighbors here, then it goes into the processed vertices. Okay. So it gets erased from the stack and whatever is the most recently added thing becomes the new top of the stack. Very good, so that's the whole algorithm. So now why is it useful and what kind of nice properties it has? So let me write down two, one I already mentioned. So the first one is let's go here. that B always spans apart. And actually, if you're a bit more careful with that, you can kind of backtrack a certain DFS tree, it's called, of how did you did this process, which is actually very useful, has some very cool properties, but we don't need anything more than it's just a path. Okay, and the second key property is that there is no edges between T and P. Right, and the reason for that is that when we moved, the only time we move a top of the stack vertex is if it has no neighbors here. When it gets moved, that means it has no neighbors inside of T. And later on in the process, we only remove stuff from T. We never add stuff into to be processed. It only gets either added to the stack or stuff gets moved here. So for the duration of the process, after it gets added here, it will never get a neighbor added here. So you will really have no edges between these two things. So in some sense, this lets you decompose a graph, vertex decomposed one time in this talk, into an anti-complete bipartite graph in the path. And this makes it actually very useful in certain Ramsey problems because it gives you like either a long path or it gives you a very strong thing which you can use for other things. So anyway, um, why do we care about it? What will we do with it? 
So we'll stop the algorithm when these two sets have the same size. And we can do that because what can happen, we have two types of steps that we're doing here. We either change the size of this by minus one, we move something from here to here, and then this one stays the same, or we move something from here to here, so this one is the same and this one changes up by plus one. Right, so in each step, the difference between T and P changes by exactly one. So either we reduce this by minus one and this stays the same, or this stays the same and this goes up by plus one. Right, so it always changes by one. At the beginning, everything is here, nothing is here. At the end, we process everything. This will end like, so at some point in the middle, some intermediate value, you'll have the same size thing. Okay, so stop when the size of P is equal to size of P and let's call this size M. Okay, so now why is this helpful at all? Well, the first observation is that this second property that we have means that all the neighbors of either of these sets, but let's say P, need to be in B, need to be on the path. Right, and our graph is an expa sublinear expander. So we never used that so far. So that means that this set needs to have at least m over log squared n neighbors. So the length of the path needs to be at least m over log squared n. Could be small. It could be large. You said for only for small sets that they have large neighborhood. So no, so this you have for all sets, one over log squared n you have for all sets. Up to two thirds. Up to two thirds, yes. And this is the point why we want them the same. Thank you. Why we want them the same size, because that ensures that none of them is bigger than a half, so that you actually can expand them. Otherwise, you would run into issues. OK? But thank you very much. Good, very good question. Anything else? So let me write that uh, this implies that the size of B is at least M over log squared n. And I claim that that also actually means that it should be at least n over three log squared n. Why? Because if m is at least n over three, then we're just done, right? This is a trivial inequality. If m is smaller than n over three, this is the whole graph. You have n over three here, n over three here. That needs to have size at least n over three. It's much bigger than what I wrote there. So actually, it's n over two is up to lower order things. But again, I don't really care too much. Okay. So we prove that we have a path of length at least that by some DFS clever magic. Uh, so now we want to convert it into cycles. And now you can forget everything about DFS. This is what we want DFS for. Now we'll play with expansion. Any questions? Okay, so So what we have so far is a long path. right? I mean long meaning n over polylog n over log squared, and this is what we're looking for. So what we do is we split it into three parts. We'll split it into x, y, and z. Y is the middle part, which has size, the size of y is n over 16 log to the 4n. So you just choose the parameters later on, but let me so far at least choose them correctly, more or less. Okay. So that's the middle part, it's actually small. So the length of this part is n over log squared n. So this is a tiny part. And I want x and z to be roughly the same size. And this we can make right with at least n over, so we had n over three log squared n. That's the length that we could guarantee there. So we can get here, say, n over eight log squared n. Okay. Now, what do I want to do? What I want to do is I want to delete this y from the picture and say that I can still connect x and z in the leftover graph. If I can do that, then I find some kind of path from x to z in the graph without vertices in y. 
And then I just join, remember that Y existed in our actual graph and just join it through Y. And this will guarantee us that actually the length of this cycle is at least the size of Y, so you get the long cycle. That's the plan, okay? So the only thing I need to do is show that you can connect any two sets of this size, even after you remove this many vertices in this sublinear expanders. So note that this is not obvious because if I wanted to join, say, two specific vertices, which you can do in a sublinear expander still, and you can definitely do in a normal expander, but here, if I remove n over 16, n over polylog and many vertices, I easily remove all of its neighbors. It can be a sublinear expander with just polylog and many neighbors, as we were saying. So there is no easy, like, the really key thing here is that these sets are big. So this gets us back to exactly this point that only big sets expand. And we will be able to do the standard argument starting from x and z. OK, so let me first explain. So let's say claim. Neighborhood for every u, uh, so u subset of g without y. So the graph when I remove vertices of y such that size of u is at most two thirds n, so that we can expand it in the original graph, and it has size at least this x and z, so n over eight log squared n. So it's a pretty big set. Then neighborhood, okay, so for any, so yeah, okay, Y is already a fixed set, doesn't, I'll just stick with Y. The neighborhood of G, inside of G with vertices of Y removed, so the rest of the argument is happening in this graph where we deleted this many of vertices, of this U should be at least size of U over two log squared n. So in the original graph, we didn't have the two. I claim that even after removal, you will keep the expansion property a tiny bit weaker. So why is that true? It's true because of the sizes that we chose. So let's explain that. So neighbor. <laughs> So neighborhood in G without Y of U certainly has size bigger than the neighborhood in the original guy without minus everything that we removed, right? And the choice of how big this set is guarantees that the neighborhood in the original graph of this U is at least this over log squared n. Right, this is how much we expand. And this is in the original graph back. So this is eight over log to the four n. And this is always at least twice the size of y. That's how we pick the numbers. So that means that here you're removing at most half of the vertices from this neighborhood by deleting this many vertices. So what you're getting is that the neighborhood in G without Y, U has size at least neighborhood in G of U over two, which is precisely, um, I'm precisely the size of U over at least, well, at least size of U over two log squared. Right, which is what we wanted for the claim, this is what we claim. Make sense? So somehow this is using very much that if you have big sets, they need to expand still decent amounts. So if I remove a smaller amount than what they are forced to expand, then they will expand after removal. You don't get that for small vertices. And that's kind of the issue with sublinear expanders that I'm also trying to somewhat highlight here. Um, Yes, so now we're pretty much done. We just do the standard connectivity argument for expanders. So remember, we had these two sets X and Z that we wanted to connect in G with all those sets Y removed. They both have size big enough so that we, they expand, right? They are, have size at least that. That's how we pick them. 
So what you do is you apply expansion, this claim expansion to X inside of G minus Y, you will reach in one step a factor of one plus one over two log squared and times the size of X vertices. So this is how many things you see in zero or one steps. You do it again, you do it again. And if you do it two log cubed that many times, so some number of times, I don't really even care how much, this will become bigger than n over two, right? And you cannot go beyond n over two because you cannot expand sets which are bigger than two thirds or something like that. But up to that point, we can do it. We reach more than half. So that's why you need to also expand from the other side, not just one. So you expand around Z precisely the same argument. Again, in each step, you get this factor extra. And again, in some polylog many steps, you're going to reach more than half. So there is an intersection. There is something that you can reach from both sides. Just because they cover both more than half of the graphs, there is a point which they both reach. That means there is a path from X to here and from Z to here, and you found your X that path. We're done. Okay. So this showcases a little bit uh, some issues with sublinear expanders, some reasons why you can get around them, because- well, we, don't, we don't need this argument, right? It's enough to say that you don't have empty cuts when both sides are large enough because of the expansion property. I agree, yes. I did want to show this one because we are going, we somewhat want to use it a bit later on, or at least point out that, uh, Repeatedly, that if you try it from a single vertex, it will not work. But you are absolutely right, yes. Um, very good. So that's a nice kind of lemma, which is actually useful for us. And it precisely showcases both what you can do with sublinear expanders and what you cannot, in some sense. At least uh, in the sense that you cannot expand small sets once you remove stuff from them. So this is what brings us to robust sublinear expansions. And this is another observation of Konlos and Semeredi from one of these original papers. And this is that when you are finding this kind of sublinear expanders, you actually get something extra for free. And this extra for free means that in terms of certain edge expansion, I'll explain now, you actually get much, much stronger robustness than what you can get cheaply just from definition of sublinear. So in normal expanders, you just use the definition of expansion and say, that means if I remove lambda u over two edges, then u still has a big neighborhood, right? So now in small expanders, if you have a set of size log squared n, then you just have one thing going out. So you can disconnect it by cutting just a single edge. And actually when you're building, when you're finding these sublinear expanders in your arbitrary graphs, you can show that you can ensure that these pictures will never happen. You can ensure that you have a lot of edges between any set, more than sublinear. You cannot get sub, uh, more than linear vertex expansion, but you can get edge expansion. And the cool thing is that you can interleave them. You can get simultaneously both things. So this is what I mean by robust sublinear expansion. We'll get sublinear expanders with the kind of strong extra property, which actually lets you avoid all of these kind of pictures, which disconnect you easily. And this makes various things true for these robust sublinear expanders, which are not true for sublinear. It also makes it much easier to work with them, it makes them much closer to the original strong expanders when you actually want to use them. So let me write a definition. I'll actually give you two different definitions because both of them have their advantages depending on what you're trying to do. And then after the definitions, I will have a short break so you can digest them. Uh, okay. So definition one of robust sublinear expansion. So G being with vertices V and edges C is a robust sublinear, and I'll abbreviate with RS for the rest of the talk. So robust sublinear S expander if for every subset U of the vertices, which is as usual not empty and has size at most two thirds n. And crucial extra thing for every subset of edges, which is not too large, 
compared to the size of the set. I'll draw a picture, which again, will, I think explain a bit better, but so far, let me write it out. Then, even if you remove this set of edges from the graph, so if you look at the neighborhood in G minus F, the set still expands sublinear. So you still get this size of U over log square. Okay? So let me draw a picture. So this definition is due to Hassel, Greg, Kim, and Liu. There are actually several competing versions. And as I said, I'll tell you another one, which is ours, and which I think kind of captures what's correct thing that's going on in the background here. But both of them have advantages in different situations. So I do want to mention them. And the others are usually somewhat weaker and you can get this stronger version. So I will just focus on this too. Anyway, going back to what's going on, we have a graph G that we want to say is a robust sublinear S expander. So what we want is again, if you pick any subset of vertices, and now the new thing is that your worst enemy comes and forbids you to use some S times the size of U edges. S you should think of big polylog. This is the thing that will be big polylog for us. And this is where the polylog is going to be coming in from that. So that's much bigger than kind of you get for free. It's some big polylog. It's log to the 200, whatever you want to put there. So quite a few edges, your worst enemy is allowed to forbid you there. So what you still want to be able to do is find some permitted edges so that you still expand by at least this little bit that we can generally do in sublinear expanders. So this should be bigger or equal than size of few overloads. So that's a picture. For any set, you can forbid a much bigger number of edges than you just get for free from the usual sublinear expansion, and you keep the sublinear expansion. That's the robustness kind of picture you get. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense to define these things with respect to the average degree, right? Like if you throw away you know, half of the degree or something like that, there's nothing, uh, it's, just, it's just you're responding it from one side, right? It, it, uh, sorry, uh, so like you're throwing away edges, right? But it would be, yeah. be meaningful to say you're throwing away some fraction of the edges touching you. Like it's the degree is D, right? So it's like, how is S related to the average degree, right? So in general, I mean, so the question is how you can find it, right? So you cannot, like, there is a trade off of what you can actually, I mean, if you have a general graph of some average degree D, what you can actually find inside of it. And of course, there will be like this S will in that case depend on the average degree. So where I'm going, it will not so much because somehow it's going to be hidden inside of this thing, right? In the we're always going to have some stuff that we sacrifice in some sense. And there I'll hide the average degree that existed. Because somehow if my graph has average degree less than polylog, then I win this theorem. But you're absolutely right. Yes, there is a trade-off. But you can also find these things, not just average degree conditions, various other things. So I'm not like, and this is not really direction, but you're absolutely right. So, so far, this is just a definition. It's a, I'm not claiming anything about it, except vaguely claiming that you can find this kind of things for free, by exactly the same way where, how they found this sublinear expanders before. And I'll tell you how that argument actually works and even a kind of twist, which gives you decompositions instead of just single ones. So for the last minute or so of the, maybe a couple more than just one minute, let me introduce the second definition, which is equivalent essentially up to some loss in parameters. So I'll also call it the robust sublinear S expander, the danger of being slightly careless, but uh, I do think, I mean, they are the same notions that I don't want to have two things. I, in, in our, I mean, in our paper, this is a lemma which follows from that, but I really think this is a definition really, because you can also get that as a lemma from this if you want. But, uh, and it's a kind of correct way of thinking about this, I think. And um, so I do want to mention it and it will be useful in a moment for us. So G, our standard setup is, an RSS expander. And if again, for every sub subset of vertices, and again, the standard assumption on empty at most size two thirds, 
But now we will not have a set of ed edges extra. It will be completely encoded by the set itself. But we will have two cases. So there are two things that can happen. The first thing is that you expand stupidly well. So the neighborhood in G of U is bigger by this factor of S than the size of U itself. And the second case is you will not expand so well. We know that you cannot guarantee this kind of thing in general graphs. You cannot do better than one over log squared n in general. So we will have log squared n, but we will have it in a certain very robust way. So this neighborhood will, will be well connected going back into the U. So the neighborhood, the robust neighborhood I'll define in a moment of U has size at least U over log squared n. And I'll also draw pictures as usual. So this is the set of all V outside of U with at least D neighbors in U. And D, from the pictures, it will be clear why I want to choose it that way, but it's S times log squared, and it's just a bit bigger polylog than S. So let me draw a picture. So one of the, one of the two. Yeah. It's one of the two. I don't know which one. But somehow, wherever you get this thing, you're golden. You have the standard extremely good expansion by a big polylog. What? At least one. At least one of the two. Yeah, yeah. Not for the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? At least one of the two. Yes. You might get both of them. But somehow, whenever you get this one, you're so good that, at least for the arguments, that uh, you're kind of in the normal big expansion world. And this one is the thing that where you need to work with. But the key thing is that you're getting this, soup, this extra strength in this hard case in some sense. So let me draw pictures and it will become hopefully a bit clearer. So the first case looks like you have U and you have very big neighborhood. So this is bigger by a factor of S, which is a big polylog than the size of U. So that means you have, just let me point out, at least S times U edges in between because you know that everyone here needs to send at least one edge back. But you don't know anything else. It may, might be just really one edge going back. The second picture is a bit different. You have U, and you have maybe a very tiny neighborhood. I mean, size of U over log squared n. But you can find this many, so you can find quite a few of them, which actually send many, many edges going back into the U, where many, many is this D, right? this parameter D that we call robustness of this neighborhood. So everyone here sends many, many edges going back, which makes it hard for you to disconnect kind of this type of, much harder for you to disconnect this type of graph. Because how many edges do you guarantee between you and its neighborhood in this picture? It's also this times D, right? And I pick D so that this is precisely S times U edges, right? The log squared then there will cancel out this log squared. Okay. So these are the two definitions, and it's fairly easy to see that at least one direction, that if you go from this definition, you get that one, because, well, with slightly weaker parameters, right? But because if you forbid, given u, s times u over two edges, in this case, you'll still get at least half of the vertices. So you're much better than what this thing wants log squared n. And in the second case, if you remove s times u over two edges, you will not be able to disconnect more than half of these vertices because this connection costs you D edges. here. If you wanted to disconnect more than half of this, you need to pay S to you over two, at least half of the edges. So given a set, if you remove S you over two edges, you still keep at least this over two many neighbors, which is precisely what the first definition is doing. It tells you that after removal of any number of edges, compared to with some reasonable size, you will get that. So let me, if you want to be, to be precise, just plug in some numbers here so that this really implies that one. You can also go the other way. If you have this one, that costs polylog. If you do it carelessly, if you do it more carefully, it costs you polylog log. If you try to really do it super carefully, maybe it even costs you nothing, but that I, we didn't need that. So, and polylog log is usually enough. Okay, so one final comment and then the break. That is that 
this parameter is not controlling the strength of your expansion. Zero expanders are not nothing. This controls the robustness of your expansion. So if you plug in a zero expander and actually, yes, so this one should be something silly so that this doesn't happen. But if you look at this definition, it's much clearer. If you plug in zero, the only place here where you're getting an S is in the bound on the forbidden set of edges, right? So if I, forbid, if I say S is zero, then you cannot forbid any edges. What you get is really the standard sublinear expanders. So they are sublinear expanders with zero robustness. You have zero amount of robustness of this form. So here really kind of the more, the bigger the S is, the more robust you are. The more stuff you can remove and still be, still maintain expansion and still maintain cool properties. So let's have a couple of minutes break and I'll copy the definition on the board so that it survives. Good. So for the second part of the talk, I want to tell you some properties that these things have and how they come together to actually uh, give you that theory. So I will not be doing very much of proofs. Again, I want to tell you the ideas a little bit behind the proofs and to carry over what kind of stuff you can expect to actually do with this kind of stuff. So the first one, the first of the lemmas that I want to mention, I call an edge subsampling lemma. So what I mean by that is, given a robust sublinear, fairly robust expander, what you can do is you can partition it, you can split its edge set into several expander, several subgraphs, so that each of them individually is a robust sublinear expand. So somewhat less robust than the original one. That's where, what you pay. So you cannot do miracles, but you can split it into multiple things. And the reason this is useful is because you can use it as a certain kind of parallelization argument. So I'll show you some connectivity properties that this robust sublinear expanders have. And for that, it's, you only need kind of a tiny bit of robustness to, for this connectivity to start to kick in. So if you start with a very robust thing, then you split it into multiple less robust things. As long as you keep a tiny bit of robustness, they will still have pretty much the same connectivity property. So if you want to connect multiple things in your graph, you can use this lemma by splitting your big robust sublinear expander into multiple smaller ones, less robust ones, which, will, which you can then use to connect different parts of your picture that you want to actually do. So it's kind of parallelization trick that you can do. And also, let me just point out that they are robust sublinear expanders on the same vertex set. So they will keep the same vertex set. Everything will still expand in this smaller things. I'm not shrinking the vertex sets and now saying only this tiny part is expander. Everything stays expander when I do that. It's going to be clear when I tell you how I do it. And the way we do it, actually how we do it, and the way how we do it is that for every edge of your original big, very robust expander, you just randomly choose into which of, say, S different sub expanders you go to. So, and then you show that if you keep every edge with probability some one over S and you start with say an S squared robust expander, then with high probability, this subsampled subgraph is still going to be a robust sublinear expander. So let me write a tiny bit more formal version of that. I really don't want to write a full formal thing because then you, I need to introduce a couple of other parameters which really don't matter so much for this. And the picture is what I want to write. So uh, robust sublinear S squared expander, and S is a big polylog again, can be decomposed into S robust sublinear S expanders. on the same vertex set. Let me again draw actually these two pictures that I somewhat inconveniently erased um, to show you a little bit why this is true. So what I claim actually is that if you take this expander and you keep every edge with probability one over S, you get at least this expander, okay? 
If you have that with high probability, then if you do it S times, that's you can ensure that each of them turns out good for one case, which is what I want to split it into this thing. So what's going on in the first? So look at the first case, first outcome of the two. You have a set U. It has S squared times U neighbors, right? And we keep each edge with probability one over S. So you expect that to see roughly S times U things to survive here. If you are happy with S times U over two, and forgive me for not including the constants that I should somewhere here, then with high probability, with really high probability compared to the size of U, you can make sure that this does happen, that any set of size, some fixed size will have at least like S times U over two neighbors surviving this subset, okay? And in the end, I want to do a union bound over all subsets. So I need an exponential probability in U times some polylog because I have two to the, I have N to the size of U such sets roughly. So I need two to the log N times U probability and something that's better than that probability. And I'm getting here precisely some big polylog. Chernoff will give you the expected number, which is S times U over whatever constant, but S is a big polylog, so that will be fine, okay? The second case is a bit more interesting. So here, what you had is we have still, so you have every vert, you have size of u over log squared n, robust neighbors, and each of them is sending back log squared n times s edges, right? So if we sample with probability one over s, you should expect that with some nice probability, kind of at least half of them should survive. You cannot guarantee that all of theirs, all of them will satisfy that. That's a polylog probability. We need n times polylog probability, exponentially n times polylog. But what you can sure ensure is that half of them will survive. So half of them will be better than half the expectation. That's two Chernoffs there, which explains why I'm not doing numbers. And Essentially, you will again get the probability if you do it carefully, which is exponential in S times U, the number of edges that you have in between. Okay, so that tells you essentially how this lemma is proved. You do a union bound, you either fall for every set in the first case or in the second case. In both cases, this subsample thing will, in this case, it will still satisfy the first case, tiny bit weaker than it was. In the second case, it will satisfy the second case, also tiny bit weaker by maybe a factor of two there. And uh, S instead of, so sorry, this should have been S squared, right? Because our big thing is expanding by S squared and only after subsampling you expect to see S log squared and to survive, which is what you want for really the S expanders. So that's the idea behind this. So let me just point out that this is very, very false for sublinear expanders. You cannot split a sublinear expander this way. And this is again our standard picture in which you have log squared n vertices with just one edge going out. Well, if you want to split it even into two, this edge can only go into one of your things. So one of your parts is not going to even be connected, let alone a sub something of an expander. So what exactly do you assume about S? Big polylog. And I'm missing some constants. And I want to be actually able to do this with a different parameter than S. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. But anyway, like throughout the talk, S is big poly. You need some kind of assumptions otherwise, but you don't really need too big. I think maybe log squared should be fine. And again, you can try to run all of these things. I think many of them would work even if you try to push it very, very tightly. It's just that we did not because we did not uh, need it. So unless there is something that needs it, uh, no need to push so hard. So yeah, so some things like that were done for normal sublinear expanders. They really pushed very hard to get tight results for various things when they needed it. But uh, so far, I don't have, I mean, I have some things for which, but I don't need all the lemmas for. The lemmas that I need tight things for are somewhat uh, relatively basic. Anyway. Um, very good. So that's the first of the lemmas that I want to mention, and it showcases one difference between robustness and normal things. So you can do this kind of random sampling arguments on robust sublinear expanders. You cannot on sublinear expanders. 
The second lemma is finally how you find these kind of objects. So I call it an almost decomposition lemma. So what it says is that if you're given an arbitrary graph, you can decompose it into robust sublinear S expanders. H1 to HT, I don't control how many, but what I do control is that I need to pay a little bit. I need to, it will be an almost decomposition. A few edges I'm not able to deal with. So it's N, big O of N times S times log N edges. Okay, so what does this lemma tell you? If you start with a graph, I can actually partition its edge set into some robust sublinear S expanders, and I can choose this S as big as I want. The only trade-off is the bigger I choose it, the more I need to pay in terms of uh, the stuff that I do not make part of my decomposition. And this is precisely kind of how this thing is proved. I will, well, how this thing is reduced to, I'll get to that. So there is one final extra property that we can do here, which is important for us. And that's that there is very little overlap between these expanders. The sense that if you sum up their orders, you'll get at most two n. So on average, every vertex is in at most two of them. This is what this thing is saying. So in some sense, they are almost not overlapping at all, yet they cover all the edges, except something that we decided to pay. Okay. So let me now show you why this thing is actually useful for reducing this theorem to just proving it for robust sublinear expanders. So this is precisely this paradigm that I told you at the beginning. You want to reduce your general problem to working on an expander. That gives you a lot of tools, which I'm now slowly telling you, which you can then use to make, to try to actually prove the thing and which makes the thing much, somewhat easier than if you try a general thing. What so, is about T? Sorry? What is about T, the number of that? Pretty much nothing which you cannot deduce from, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I can say that it's not bigger than polylog, but I would need to check. So this is very, careful induction. I'll tell you one line about the proof, the interesting line about the proof. And after that, it's a very careful induction that you don't lose too much by doing this kind of stuff. Um, I'll, I'll get to that, but I would first like to show you why it's actually relevant to that problem or well, why, how you can reduce it to expanders. And this will also explain why various conditions and things actually exist inside of it. Okay? Uh, so I'll get back to that in a few minutes. So claim, I should go there, this reduces theorem 2 <coughs> to special case of RSS expanders. So if you can prove theorem 2 for robust sublinear S expanders, with an arbitrarily big polylog S, then you get the proof for all graphs. So why is that? Well, you just start with your general graph, you decompose it into robust sublinear S expanders. Now I'm assuming that I know how to decompose each of these expanders, right? That's the claim. I'm assuming I know how to do that. That's what I want to do for the rest of the talk. So if I can do that, I claim I won. Why? So Use assumption to decompose each HI that you get from the lemma. So we apply the lemma to the gen to the arbitrary graph, we get a decomposition in this robust sublinear expanders and some n times polylog and many edges. 
These just automatically go into the trash bin. They are leftover. We don't care. And I can put this S to be as big as I want, as long as it's polygon. That's what we're allowed to pay. And then what's the cost? So how much, how many cycles and edges do I need to decompose each one of them just by the assumption that the theorem is true for it? So we pay a sum of order of HI cycles. Right, so each HI I can decompose into a linear number of cycles and size of HI times polylog size of HI edges. So the total cost here is at most big O of N. Why? Because of this no overlap condition. When you sum up over all these things, they have size at most 2N. You don't have too much overlap. So in total, you will just be paying linear number of cycles, even when you're with your original graph that you decomposed. So this is somewhat surprising thing here that you can do that and that this is actually works out so nicely, but it's really the key thing as well. So also how many edges do we pay? So it's big O of size of HI. And here I could put log of order of HI, polylog of order of HI, but I'll just be wasteful and put N, polylog of N. And again, when you sum up, and you use this no too big overlap, this will again become n, right? Again, it will again become n times polylog, which is again what we are allowed to pay. Make sense? So this shows precisely this paradigm. You can reduce the general problem to just working on an expander. In this case, robust sublinear expander of arbitrary polylog, at least for our result, is in some sense, the strongest version of expand, at least as far as I'm aware of, maybe there is some other twist which you can add, but uh, which you can get here. Okay, very good. So I promised you one line about how this decomposition lemma is proved. And I do owe you this line because it explains how you also find this sublinear and also robust sublinear expanders in, in a general graph. So, let me, so this definition I copied on that sideboard so that it survives. Um, if you want to look at it at some point. So, and because I actually need to write what I erased right now, I want to use that one. So what will we do? So we have an arbitrary graph and we want to decompose it into robust sublinear expanders, almost decompose. It. So if it is already a robust sublinear expander, we're done. We just take a trivial partition, right? We don't need to pay any extra edges. We have perfect number of vertices, we're happy. So we can assume that our initial graph is not a robust sublinear S expander. It's not an expander itself. So you just negate, negate this definition. That means there exists a subset of vertices of this kind of size, and there exists a set of edges such that if you remove them, it does not expand well enough. It's an exercise in logic. So if um, G not RSS expander, then there exists a U such that its size, it's not empty and its size is at most, is by at least a factor of, here it actually matters a bit, a, fact, a constant factor smaller than the big graph. And there exists a set of edges F, which has size uh, at most S times the size of U, such that, the neighborhood in G minus F of U is smaller than this sublinear thing that we would like to see. Otherwise, if this is true for all U and F, then you, it is a robust sublinear expander, we're done. It's okay, so let me draw a picture. What does that mean? It means that in your graph G, draw G a bit differently this time, something like that. So in your graph G, you have some set U, and you have some set of edges, which we usually think of as forbidden, such that after you remove these edges, 
anything that any edges that survive it expands in a tiny place smaller than what we want to have this sublinear expansion okay so what we'll do is we are just going to sacrifice the red edges they are small compared to the size of u which is shrinking by a constant factor every time so in some sense it should only shrink logarithmically many times I'm cheating you here. I don't actually have a good explanation of why the numbers work out for what they are. Just trying to give you a bit of intuition why this will work out. Other than just working out the nasty, slightly nasty computations. It's one page, it's not too bad, but still not pleasant for a talk. So you remove these red edges. You control how many you're removing in terms of what's the size of your smaller set. Might not be smaller, but it's smaller than a factor of n, and you know the other one is always at least linear, so it doesn't matter. So that will be our sacrifice, sacrificial edges, the ones that we take out. And what we do now is just repeat on two parts of the graph. So we repeat on u together with its remaining neighborhood, and we'll repeat on everything outside of u. By repeat, I mean either, again, it, if these things are robust sublinear expanders, then I claim we've won. They have a tiny bit of overlap, right? That's something smaller by log square than factor. They, we sacrifice S times size of U, which is less than whatever we are allowed. So if these things are robust sublinear expanders, we won. If not, just use induction on them. Split them into robust sublinear expanders to end some leftover edges and then add up all the contributions that you need to pay. And the key thing is really that this thing is so small, the overlap, that since you are shrinking by a constant factor in some sense every time, over the whole process, if you do careful tracking, you will not add more than just another factor in the number of vertices that you get in total overlaps. This is not at all obvious. It's, yeah. And it's still slightly annoyed that I don't have a good picture in mind why these numbers work out like that, but with some polylogs, they will certainly work out. And log squared turns seems to be really what you, this is where log squared comes from. I think you don't get it better with them, log squared. Like you. you can get a bit better robust sublinear expanders in general, but so this is precisely also how you construct sublinear expanders. And I think very often normal expanders as well. The only difference is that usually you just go into one of the two places. Right, you go into the denser of the two places in some uh, like bigger average degree or whatever you're looking at. And then you repeat there and you repeat until you find your robust sublinear subgraph, which is an expand. And uh, here, what we are doing is we keep track of everything. So we treat, we deal with the whole picture all the time. This is why we can get the decomposition rather than just a single existence result. Good, so that's as much as I wanted to tell you about this lemma. Uh, so let me move to the next one, which is somewhat why, uh, not two, just one. I have two more lemmas left, and then I'm done. <laughs> well, I want to show you how they come together if I'll have time, but uh, hopefully I will. Anyway, uh, so the second next lemma is something kind of, it makes sense that this should be true, but we need it in an extremely strong form. So we want that these robust sublinear expanders are extremely well connected in a certain sense, uh, which is something we kind of know for usual expanders. But here, because of precisely this removal of a single edge is a problem for normal sublinear things, the robustness precisely gives you the power to recover these connectedness properties. Let me write what I mean exactly. So definition G. Again, GVE is L1 path connected. I'll draw a picture, which I think again is saying a bit more than words. If for every family of these joint pairs of vertices, Let's call it P and it's equal to X1, Y1. So these are X2, Y2. So I give you a bunch of points in your graph. 
x t y t. The only restriction is that they are not you have no overlaps. Then there exist x i y i paths p i let's say such that one p i are short the length of p i is at most l and two they are edge disjoint. I'll draw a picture. Otherwise, it's a lot of work. So suppose you have your, well, we want to show that this is true for a bus sublinear expander, but so far it's just a definition. So graph G is this L1 path connected. If no matter how you choose some pairs of points in your graph, you can connect them and you can connect really the correct pairs. So this is x1, y1 by short paths. Short is that. Okay. So this is the connectivity property I want. So uh, just to point out a few things, I really want to be able to join the correct pairs. And I want to be able to do this with potentially linearly many points. I only want no overlaps between these things. So you could have n over two pairs of these points. They could split your whole graph. It's pretty amazing that you can actually do something like that. Um, very good. And not only can you do that, I actually have two other conditions that I want here, which I did not write. And I'll slowly introduce. So let me first write the lemma. Well, just a statement more or less. But um, a robust sublinear, say log to the eight n, I'm just plugging in the numbers to give you a bit of a feeling what's going on. I don't claim that log to the eight n is actually correct. Rob robust sublinear log to the eight n expander is log to the four n one path connected. So you can find these paths of length polylog in an expander in this kind of robust sublinear expanders. Okay, so let me just, I will not give you a proof of this. That is actually kind of the main part of the paper and it is actually the, the best illustration of what the, the power of these robust sublinear expanders. But if I do go into that, I'll spend the rest of the talk doing that. And I'd rather tell you how all of this stuff comes together to actually give you a result that I started. So I want to tell you why the trivial thing that, I mean, the obvious thing to try to do fails and somehow also to highlight how strong this linear thing that you're getting there is. So what would be the natural way of trying to prove this that you usually do in expanders? So let's just look at x1 and y1, and let's do this argument of expanding around both of them, right? I expand around the single vertex set x1, then its neighborhood and so on. So sure, I'll be happy, like we expand by a factor of one over log squared n, so log cubed then like, You'll get the path between these two things of length two log cubed n. That's less than log to the four n. That's where that comes from. Sure, you can do it, right? So one pair I can always connect. That's the standard property of expanders. Now let's look at the second one. So I claim we can still do it. Why? Because just treat all the edges of the path that you found there as forbidden. Right? This is precisely what this robust sublinear expander business is about. I forbid log to the four n edges. So that's still okay, even if for a single vertex expansion, I can forbid big polylog many edges and still expand the single vertex thing. So I find the next one. And you can do this for, depending on S, some polylog many pairs, right? So polylog many, many pairs, you can get here. But I really want linear here. I want to be able to do this for a linear number of pairs. And if you assume even that you're successful up to the very last point somehow, Right, so at this point you are at x t minus one, y t minus one. So how many edges are we forbidding? We're potentially forbidding big O of n log to the four n edges, right? It's log to the four n of them, and we have n over two, might slightly tiny, a bit less pairs that are there. So you have absolutely no chance in the universe of expanding a single vertex thing. Right? It only expands up to polylog and removal. We are removing n times polylog. 
And this really shows why kind of this is not at all obvious and some interesting stuff goes into proving this. For example, one trick is using a Haroni Haxel hypergraph version of Hall's theorem. So that somehow magically allows you to, instead of really being able to join each pair individually, it, like each specific pairs that you're given, just show that you have many, many paths for any subset of pairs that you get. If you have that, then you can do some kind of greedy trick and choose one per each somehow. If you have a lot of these short pairs, it's not at all obvious. You need to introduce some auxiliary hypergraphs and uh, play with it, but it gives you a little bit of leeway compared to the strength that we want. And it's a crucial leeway. And then the second trick is to use this idea that big sets expand. So even if you remove something like that and S is a big polylog, then N over polylog size sets will expand. In particular, sets of size T over two here will expand. So if you start somehow from half of your excess, you will reach more than half. And now a trick is that you can, you can use some averaging trick to say that that means that from half the size of this X, from, you split this X into two parts. And from one of these two parts, you can reach half of the vertices you could originate. Originally you reached N over two, more than N over two. Now you're reaching N over four, but you're reaching it from a smaller set, from a set of size half. And this final bit is of size N over four. It's massive, it expands. So you just bootstrap and you expand that instead of your smaller starting set. And that will get you again in a few steps to log uh, to N over two, and then you shrink it again. You shrink it again, you shrink it again. And eventually you'll get a single vertex point, not all of them, but one of these X's, which actually can reach more than a half. And because you could do it from any half of the vertices here, you can actually make sure that half of them expand to more than a half. And then you can play that game. You can find two of them, which both expand, you find intersection, you win. So I was fast here, I know I was fast. This actually takes some time and care to explain what I did now, but... Uh, Again, I'm more focusing on telling you rough ideas of um, stuff behind all of this. Uh, okay. So I just wanted to say that this is not at all obvious. You need to, but some nice tricks go into doing that. Very good. So now the second thing that I want, there, like I defined L1 path connected because I actually want something slightly bit stronger. So LT path connected is exactly the same thing, except I allow some overlap between the pairs. In particular, every point can be in at most T pairs. Okay, so this I call T disjoint. So we might have some extra things that we need to connect here. So say this is X4, and this is also Y4, and this is X3, and this is also Y3. So you get some kind of overlap between the things that you want to get. And then there is an easy corollary of this lemma, which says that if you take a tiny bit again, stronger robust sublinear expansion, well, stronger in robustness sense. So now I want log to the 16n. Then it actually allows you some overlap between the points. So it has the log to the 4n, log to the 4n. Connectivity property. Okay, and this I can actually sketch, I mean, briefly sketch how you do from one to the other, because it's precisely the illustration of how you do this parallelization for edge subset. So how are we going to do it? You have your now a bit stronger robust sublinear expander. Let's just split it into log to the four and say sub subgraphs, each of which is log to the eight n expand. So each of the smaller things you can use to connect disjoint points by this level. So now the only thing you need to do is you need to split this picture. Like you need to split your things into log to the four n different collections so that they're all each individually is disjoint. So for example, if you do the white edges as one family, the blue edges as another family, each is individually disjoint. So this property is true. And then you just use one of your sub expanders to deal with the blue edges, one of them to deal with the white edges, and 
you get this, you boost your kind of property. But this will only boost you by polylogs because you cannot decompose into more than polylog kind of expanders here. So you really need to be doing this stuff that I didn't tell you about uh, to prove this original level. Because the natural way of trying to cheat here is let's just boost this. Let's use this with the original polylog to get. But no, it lets you at the very end where this kind of argument starts to fail when you have some too many really things, n times polylog things that you would like to connect, you can reduce this to n over polylog, which is important for that. And it's a cool illustration of how that can be useful. Okay. Very good. So there is a final property, I'm sorry, that you can ensure in addition to all of this magic about this. And this one, I really just want to sketch because it's probably it's the hardest piece of the paper and kind of the thing we worked hardest for. And it's very specific to what we're doing. So, I mean, it's cool, but uh, not so, uh, I mean, yeah, anyway, uh, it's a very, very nice argument using some kind of, prolonged exposure of randomness and we have some original uh, random process argument doing that. But essentially what I want to be able to do is not only connect linear n times polylog and many points, I actually want to ensure that they go for a specific place in my graph. So if I choose a subset of my graph with probability, each vertex I choose with probability one third. Okay, so I, this is a random subset of my graph. I want to be able to find all of these short paths to actually go only through this random subset. And by that, I mean all of their internal vertices are inside of the randomly subset of thing with high probability with, so there is another condition here, which pretty much is saying that in a moment, I'll explain really where this pops up, but it poses a lot of difficulty because this robustness is not actually robust to vertex removal in some sense. It's robust to edge removal. So you need to be very, very careful here and track what's going on with your expander. Somehow boost it to a normal expander, go back. Anyway, I don't have time to tell you much about that, but uh, I can tell you the final lemma and then how all of this comes together. Oh, wait, uh, I started 10.30, right? Okay, so I do have 10 more minutes. Okay, that should be enough. So the final lemma uh, is that there exists a skeleton. So any robust sublinear expander will have a skeleton. What I mean by that is that it has a sparse subgraph which retains essentially the same expansion properties. Okay, essentially the same here is with quotation marks. You lose some form of it. But the really cool thing is that even if you start with a clique in some sense, I mean, that's a silly example, but that's a super good expander. I can find a sparse subgraph of a clique. Well, that's a random graph, obviously, usually, but which has some, which inherits some of these robust sublinear expansion properties. And the thing is that you can do that for any graph, no matter which graph has some robust sublinear expander. I claim it's a robust sublinear expander because of some n times polylog and many edges inside. Of it. If I just look at this n polylog n, I get the expansion and I don't care about anything else in your graph. There is a sparse witness of your expansion, okay? That's the idea. It's not at all something that's easy to prove. I mean, it's actually now with the lemmas and stuff we have will be not too hard, but it's not at all a natural, well, I don't know, anyway. So the way we find this kind of skeleton is by using the so-called template method, which is something that Richard Montgomery, my co-author for all of this, if I did not say wrote, but maybe I didn't say, um, who introduced and developed this method over the past 10 years, actually told, used it also in the previous talk that uh, I, I gave here. And it's quite useful in the number. It's really powerful and cool trick. So let me just again sketch that, sketch what's going to be using, what, what's going to be happening here. So we are going to use the random graph, an excellent expander, with density log to the four n over n as a template to design the skeleton. So let's call this A, which is distributed as this random graph. So it's auxiliary random graph. So what I mean by that is you have your robust sublinear expander G and I drop on top of it, 
an auxiliary random graph with this density. Okay, so this puts me some kind of pairs. Right, it puts me some kind of pairs that uh, can, that these are random edges that actually got sampled into the random graph. So what we want to do is we would like that all these pairs that we got are actually edges. If they are, we're golden. You have a random graph inside of your thing. You're a much better expander than whatever we're doing. But of course, it's not really, you cannot really do that. But you can observe that this A will, with high probability, have, say, maximum degree at most 2 log 4 to the n. Right? It's, it's, this is its density. You'll not have, you can ensure that the outcome has at most this many, that everyone has this as a max degree. So if you treat each edge of your auxiliary random graph as a pair to connect, then you only get log to the 4n overlap. Right? So every vertex will be in at most log to the 4n pairs. So the trick is we're just going to use the edges of this auxiliary random graph as pairs for our strong connectivity property. And we just said, if you have a robust sublinear expander, I can put short paths which join any collection of these kind of pairs. Right, so now they become short paths instead of edges, but in some sense you are embedding a random graph inside of your arbitrary robust sublinear expander. And if you track this a little bit carefully back and show that this thing is actually has this path connectivity property, which is somewhat easier than for robust sublinear expanders, you get that this skeleton also has the slightly weaker PCP property. So it's still connected in the same way as the original expander. You can even show that how would you connect the edges of this skeleton? So they are just a random graph, which you ensure is an expander in a certain way. Well, you ensure that it satisfies the PCP property with high probability in addition to the number of edges. But you didn't just say that you are going with two of the PCP property? No, 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 no. So I mean. So for PCP property, if you want, you can just prove that GNPG, this graph is actually a robust sublinear expander. It's a very cheating way of doing it. You can do it much more easily for, uh, yeah. So there's no limit on the number of pairs over there? So you will have, and I mean, you have a limit in the sense that every vertex appears at most log to the 4n many times. So you'll have n times log to the 4n at most pairs. But there will, the edge, there will not be edges joint anymore, right? So, no, so these pairs will be edge disjoint. They will not be vertex disjoint. But, but in, in the theorem there, there's no limit in the number of pairs? I, I mean, the limit of the number of pairs is coming secretly from this T disjoint thing. So I don't allow your vertex to appear more than T times. Oh, okay. I, I did consider. OK, sorry. Yeah. That's the reflection of the light. So. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's the D. That would be the? The degree, so in total, like this thing has n times log to the four and many edges. This is precisely and precisely why we needed this little bit of extra boost over just linear so that we can actually do this kind of business. So it gives you a random graph in some sense. I mean, it's not good for everything because you might have overlaps between these short paths in vertices, not in edges. But for our purposes, for connecting with edge disjoint paths, this is perfect. And for various types of connectivity and things, you can actually do this kind of magic. Fine. So this was the last lemma. So now I finally can sketch how you put this stuff together to actually get that decomposition. Uh, any questions about, I mean, you, yeah. yeah. You seem to be, yeah, you know that you can stop me and ask questions at any point. Standard here. Anyway. Okay, so what are we doing now? So I told you that this reduces to just decomposing a robust sublinear expander. So let's take the uh, robust sublinear S expander with S being big, big polygon. Right? This is what the reduction of the almost decomposition thing gave us. And our task is to decompose it into linearly many cycles and n times polylog and many edges. So what will we do first? We'll take a skeleton. Let S be a skeleton. So note here, 
forgot to say that since this graph with high probability has n times log to the 4n many edges, each part has length log to the 4n, the actual skeleton has n times log to the 8n edges. So it's n times polyl, it's a sparse thing. Because I replaced each of the edges with at most log to the 4n edges. So it's still sparse, maybe a bit less sparse, but sparse. So S has number of edges of S similar or equal than big O of n times polylog. This will be useful for us at the end because we'll be able to sacrifice whatever we don't use. And now we look at G without S. We kick out the skeleton and our body collapses. Well, not, hopefully not, but anyway, um, we take the skeleton out. And um, what we want to do is, what do we want to do? Ah, yes, yeah, so we want to use this thing that I mentioned from some long time ago, LOVA's decomposition result. I think it might be on the board there still. This one. So we decompose the rest of the graph using the LOVA's thing. Decompose G without S into at most n parts with well spread n vertices. Two disjoint with our notation set of n vertex pairs. Right? So Lomas tells us you can decompose your graph into just n parts. So that their endpoints are, well, this is a corollary of this, but that no one is an endpoint of more than two. And now you see kind of why we want this well-spread property, because we want to use the path connectivity property. We don't want that one point is an endpoint of all of the paths, because you cannot then join it because the max degree in our skeleton is polylog n. You cannot join more than polylog things starting from a single vertex. Okay, so now let's draw a picture and finish off, almost finish off. So now you have this G without the skeleton and you have a path decomposition of all of G without S, except you have some kind of endpoint. So this was a path, right? This is a path maybe, you have a bunch of paths, they're edge disjoint, they're edge decomposition, they give you a bunch of pairs. So now we remember that we put aside this skeleton business at the beginning, and we just use the PCP property to connect them, right? So we just use the skeleton edges to find some short path here, short path here, short path here. We can do this edge disjointly, even if you have a linear number of paths, we can do it. So that gives you almost the result. Someone see a problem? I'm asking for much, you know, but uh, there is a problem. The problem is that the pair cannot be the same as the pair that has in the skeleton. No, so the skeleton can deal with any pairs. That's what PCP means, right? So we just use in PCP in two different ways. One was to build a skeleton, but now skeleton has the property that for any pair it can join things. It's an expander. This is the prop connecting property of expanders. But very good attempt. No, so the thing is that Lovas thing spits you out potentially very long paths. So if you have, you don't control what's going on with LOVAS, and if your graph is dense, your paths will actually be maybe even Hamiltonian, forced to be Hamiltonian, to go for everything. So when we find these short paths, you cannot avoid them intersecting the paths from LOVAS decomposition. They have polylog and length, you obviously can just cut them down into pieces, but they have polylog length. You might get polylog many cycles. That's bad. We need linear. We need really constant for each of these. So what we need to do, this is why this random business comes into play, the thing that's not written here, is to somehow split the graph. And in one part of the graph, we'll find the lowest decomposition, decomposition stuff, and we'll connect everything through a different part of the graph. So just to give you a tiny bit more information to complete, because I think this is a nice trick as well, so you split your graph into three pieces uniformly at random. Everyone goes into a piece with the same probability, one third. So individually, these are these vertex subsampled subsets of vertices. 
So what you do now is you split the edges into three parts. We have blue edges, we have orange edges, and we have yellow edges. These are everything. Every edge goes inside of this. And this is G without the skeleton. We still have skeleton also. And now I'll just decompose the blue edges with loss. So that forces my loss paths to live on V1 union V3, not to live at all inside of V2. And then if I use this PCP property with the random subset, I can ensure that the short paths will all go through the third set where these guys don't have anything, so you avoid overlaps. That's it. And then whatever's left with the uh, with the skeleton thing, you can just sacrifice as an polylog and you're done. And thank you for your attention. Yeah. I think this decomposition they can be useful for other problems. I hope so. So I know already one, so kind of from a previous version of this. Um, so I know one specific application where someone managed to use quite a few of our things to prove something about. It's still in the works, so let me not say quite, uh, but a nice thing that uh, a very nice result. And also we had some kind of um, ideas of how it gives simpler proofs of some results on rainbow cycles and uh, minor decompositions. And uh, so we're not all, but several pieces of it. So. Like one of the reasons why I really wanted to give this talk is to also kind of, if someone has a problem in which expansion, like it would be very good if you have an excellent expander and- uh, I think about unique games. I mean, that's like, the, I think that a lot of the algorithms are- I'm very happy to hear about that. And uh, so yeah, I've been tracking down people around and asking, do you have a problem with, <laughs> because I think it really sounds like it could be very useful. It does have some drawbacks in the sense that like it's dealing with edge decomposition stuff. So like if you want to avoid vertex stuff, it becomes much harder. I mean, some things you can do, but, and in general, yeah. So there is actually a long list of applications of these kinds of things, but also generally just the sublinear expanders. So Hong Liu and Richard Montgomery are kind of experts on this. And there is a very nice survey of uh, Hong, which uh, details just the use of sublinear stuff but this kind of makes certain things possible, which are not possible for sublinear things. And this is what seems to me that it could really be uh, quite useful in a number of things. But yeah, it's very fairly new still. Um, so, and already there are a few things which people figured out how to use it for other stuff. I'm very interested in uh, hearing any problem which has this feeling that uh, if you have a good expander, you would win immediately, but somehow you cannot find a good enough expander. So. Maybe this kind of business or modifications could be very useful for this kind of problem. Okay, sorry for keeping you from lunch for uh, um, 